Ring-a-ding is a 7 foot 9 inch pram dinghy designed by C.P. and E.D. Burgess with plan revisions by Edwin Monk and some building notes by myself, David N. Goodchild. Here's an, all, an ideal all-purpose plywood dinghy, handy for the yachtsman who needs a strong, seaworthy craft or the sportsman who needs a lightweight car top boat. It is easy for youngsters to row yet sturdy enough for small outboard motor. With all these features, this little dinghy is simple enough in design for even a beginner to tackle by following these simple instructions. I built this dinghy for my little niece, actually grandniece. It is a good sailor and a very handy tender. There are a couple of things to note, however. In the picture before, the towing eye is mounted much too high on the bow. The eye should be mounted as low down as possible so as not to depress the bow in towing. It also projects too far and will be vulnerable to bending. Also, I followed the dimensions when cutting out the side panels but found they were an inch too short when offered up. Could be an error in the plans or my measuring and cutting, but I would keep an eye on this. I had to shorten up the frame dimensions to fit the planking. The design is worked in oak, mahogany and fir plywood with spruce or fir for the mast if you, wish it to rig it, if you wish to rig it for sailing. For the plywood use Douglas fir exterior grade. Mahogany is used for the keel. The framing is in oak while the seat rises and supports may be oak or mahogany. I used white pine for everything. It worked out fine. First you must assemble the materials. In addition to the wood and fastenings you will need glue and clamps. You will also need primers, paints, undercoat, top coat, as well as anti-fouling bottom plate if the boat is to be left on a mooring. If it is not, then you can depend, dispense with the bottom plate. Before you begin work, study these plans until the details of each step in construction are clear in your mind. The hull is constructed bottom up on saw horses or cross pieces. Later it is reversed so that work can be done on the interior of the boat. The layout. First, draw full-sized outlines of the bow and transom panels on the half-inch fur plywood. To lay out the curved bottom of the transom, tack brads at dimension points. Then spring a quarter-inch thick batten around these brads and draw the curve along the batten. Either cut out the panels with your saw angle to cut the bevels shown in the plan, or cut the panels slightly oversized and bevel to the outlines with a plane. Or, if you're careful, with a belt sander. Frame both panels with 3 quarter inch thick hardwood. Note that the notches for the chines are cut in the hardwood frames only, not through the plywood bow or transom. Assemble the frames to the panels with waterproof glue and 1 inch galvanized deck screws. Here is where you should make a choice on glues. Liquid nails, epoxy or Franklin tight bond 2. Liquid nails is an easily applied cork-like material which forms a very good seal between the mating edges and is a durable adhesive. It should be used on a boat, however, only where the joint is also made up with screw fasteners <coughs> so it cannot stand extreme tensions. Epoxy is probably the best choice for any boat, though the most expensive. It is highly water resistant and fills gaps well, especially when thickened with fumed silica, otherwise known as cabosil. Franklin Tight Bond 2 is a waterproof glue which is stronger than the wood grain but is not recommended for use below the waterline. If the boat is not to be kept on a mooring, however, this would be quite adequate. It is not, however, a gap filling glue. Our recommendation would be for epoxy. It's not necessary to bevel the edges of the molds, notch them for the chines, however, and notch the mold for Station 1 to fit over the setup stringers. Setup. Assemble these stringers, the temporary backbone on which you'll build your dinghy, as shown in the plan. Mount them across saw horses or solid cross pieces. When you've checked to see that they're parallel, level and ends lined up exactly, drive a 3 inch deck screw, toenail fashion, into each end to hold them down securely. Then measure off locations for the two molds and fasten cleats to the outer sides of the stringers at these marks. Screw the molds to these cleats with deck screws. Photo A. Now you're ready to fit the 5 8 by 1 and a quarter inch chines. Mortise the ends of these strips carefully into the blind notches at bow and transom. After fitting, brush the ends of the chines liberally with glue and screw them to the hardwood frames with one and a half inch deck screws. Photo B. Drive the screws in so that the screw heads countersink. The chines are not fastened to the molds, but simply bent across them. 
playing each chime to fare with a bow and transom, and also fare up the bevels on the frames. Springing a strip of quarter-inch plywood across the framework will show you the exact bevels required. Working carefully with your plane, or belt sander, take off high spots and correct the bevels until you're sure the side and bottom planks will lay up tightly against the framework at all points. Fitting the side and bottom planks. The side planks are fitted first. Saw them to the approximate shape shown in the plan, allowing enough material for trimming and clamp them temporarily in place to check the fit. If you use a jigsaw to cut them roughly to shape, use a fine tooth blade to avoid too much splitting and splintering of the plywood. If the rough fit is good enough, before fastening them permanently, spread waterproof glue along the bow and transom assemblies and the chines, not along the edges of the molds of course. Fasten the sides with three quarter inch deck screws spaced about two and a half inches apart. Once the side planks are fastened in, take a router or plane and trim off the access. If you use a router, use a laminate trimming bit with a bearing pilot. There will still be a little excess left over since there is an angle to the side planks and the laminate trimmer trims at 90 degrees. A little work with the plane and or belt sander, however, will fare this up. To mark the shape of the bottom plank, clamp and brace the plywood over the framework and pencil along the chines, bow and transom. Photo C. You can either cut this out rough now with a jib saw or circular saw, or simply fasten down the whole panel and trim with the router again. Either way, don't forget to glue down the panel to the chines before fastening. When you've screwed on the rub strips, keel, keel batten and guards, photo D, you're ready to turn your dinghy right side up. The finish detail. Drive small nails through the side planks into the molds to hold the molds in place and turn the dinghy right side up. Then remove the setup stringers, photo E, and fit the seats. To fasten seat risers and supports with glue and screws driven through the plywood sides into these members. After installing the seats, take a dry run in your boat on the shop floor to position the row lock blocks as you want them. Finally, prime the plywood well and seal all edges, whether exposed or not, with a good marine primer. Paint using undercoat and finish coat, as well as an anti-fouling paint for the bottom if the boat is to be kept in the water at all times. Rigging your dinghy for sailing. To rig your dinghy for sailing, you will need extra materials with which to make the mast step, the mast itself, choose lumber as straight as possible, the rudder, and if you're ambitious, unbleached muslin to make a sail. I made a sail from unbleached muslin, it wasn't difficult. You can also use a part of a poly top or even canvas. You will also need an old inner tube as well as rudder hardware. I'm currently looking at painter's drop cloths for sail making. The listing for the additional wooden fastening is given later. Note, the underwater area of the daggerboard and rudder determines the size of the sail your dinghy can carry. Should you decide to gaff rig or split rig the boat, which would increase the sail area somewhat, be sure to increase the underwater area of the daggerboard and rudder proportionally. The daggerboard. The daggerboard slides in a watertight plywood trunk or well mounted in the bottom of the boat. Assemble the daggerboard trunk with waterproof glue and screws or galvanized nails. Set the trunk in the dinghy bottom, centering it immediately in front of the seat supports and mark its position. At this bottom the point, the bottom curves slightly. Shape the lower end of the trunk with a rasp and sanding block to conform to this curve. Then fasten the assembly in place with screws driven through the dinghy bottom into the trunk cleats. Use rubber-based sealing compound in the joint. Now turn your dinghy over and slot the bottom. After boring starting holes, cut the slot with a small keyhole saw and square it to the trunk opening with a rasp. Take care not to splinter the plywood. Then fasten hardwood molding along the edges of the slot. Cut the trunk cap from quarter inch thick plywood. Screw it both to the trunk and to the seat supports. An end cleat on the dagger board seats against this cap when the board is, when the board is slid into place, with keepers cut from old inner t- auto inner tube, preventing the boat from floating the board from floating when the dinghy is in the water. To close the trunk, you may want to use the dinghy as an outboard, in which case the trunk must be closed. To do this, make a plug similar to the dagger board, but cut off flush with the bottom. The mast. Rasp the mast step to fit the curve of the dinghy bottom. In the center of the step, chisel a square mortise. Bolt the mast support to cleats mounted on the side planks. Cut a square mast hole in the center of the support. 
Taper lengths of lumber are shown in the plan with a plane or smoke shave. Note that the base of the mast is left square and tenoned on the end to seat in the mortise chisel of the mast step. Either fit a plywood drawer on the boom as shown in the plan or buy a ready-made gooseneck, fi gooseneck fitting. Place your dinghy flat on the floor to position the step and mast support accurately. Insert the mast and plumb it with a carpenter's level, marking locations for the step and support. Photo G. Glue and screw the step. Then trim the mast support to length and bore bolt holes. Use carriage bolts with wing nuts to fasten it to the hardwood mounting cleats. Rudder assembly. Saw the half inch thick plywood rudder to shape and fit plywood cheek pieces and filler block. Pin a tiller sh shape from hardwood to the rudder with a carriage bolt. The drawings show how to make rudder hardware from brass rod and bar stock. Photo H. If you prefer, buy ready-made pimples and gudgeons at a marine supply house. Now your dinghy is ready for painting and rigging. Photo I. Remember to paint the inside. <coughs> Remember to paint the inside surfaces of the daggerboard trunk. Use a bottle brush. Wicking. To make your own sail, stitch together lengths of 3 to 4 ounce per square foot unbleached muslin, which you can buy at a department store. Sew on 8 inch diameter rope in the hems, reinforce the corners, and space grommets along two edges as shown in the plan. If you can't find the muslin, you can use canvas, though this will be heavier. If you can't get either one, you can use a piece of a poly top, though the blue is not quite as attractive as a white sail. White poly top is available, but only in large quantities. Actually, you can buy white poly tops at very reasonable prices online from Canopies and Tops. The URL is http colon slash slash www.canopiesandtops.com slash tops dash white dash tops dot html. There are also other listings, just Google White Poly Tops. You can buy complete White Poly Top sale kits from PolySale International. Their URL is http colon slash slash www.polysale.com. If you use the top, you can reinforce the bolt rope stitching with duct tape. If you feel you can't qualify as a sale maker, turn this part over to the job over to a tent and awning firm. Lash the sail to the mast and boom with 316 diameter cotton rope.